situation in Australia and their heart disease rate is twice that of the population. So they took 78 of them that still knew how to hunt, gather and cook the native way. But that were in a bad way. They're obese, diabetic or pre-diabetic, had established heart disease, all inflammatory markers that I'm going to talk about was on fire. These were men and women that were dying, but still functional. They took them in a bunch of buses, and it showed, it showed them pictures, a bunch of Greyhound buses, and just dropped them off in their native land. Said, here, survive. This is a seven week project. Gave them a few tools to build houses, tools for hunting and gathering, and said, just go for it. So they did, gathered them up again after seven weeks, and we measured all the numbers. And wouldn't you know it that virtually every one of them had totally, and I mean totally, normalized all their blood work in just seven weeks. Symptoms of angina, gone. People who needed bypass, and they, they showed the before and after angiograms. Gone. Seven weeks. I was absolutely stunned by the rapidity. I was not stunned by the fact that it, that it happened, but it was the, how fast it could go. So I made myself a note here, and I left it on my desk, I believe. There's, little three, uh, there's three little red cards that has some, some data on it. Um, it and, and really what it's, it shows is the incredible power that's been given to us to heal from within. I got a, a heads up from that from a Dr. Gundry, cardiologist in Palm Springs, who I met seven years ago. And Dr. Gundry was woken up by the fact that maybe our model of just bad cholesterol is not really what this is all about. That maybe the heart disease issue that we have is much more complex and comes from many different sources. And thanks so much. And Dr. Gundry embarked on a program and really what happened was he was uh, what he calls a stent jockey. Uh, a stent jockey is somebody who just puts in stents all day long. He said over 800 a, a year. Uh, and uh, then he came across this Harley Davidson dude um, that comes in and had his left anterior descending artery, which is sometimes called the widow maker, uh, was almost completely blocked. This was uh, obviously a walking time bomb and insisted on trying to clear it just on his own. But he wanted this doctor to monitor it. Dr. Gundry took a liking to him. Most cardiologists wouldn't do this. And um, he says, okay, go for it. So came back six months later, redid the angiogram and had improved it by over 50%. Dr. Gundry was blown away. How could a guy like this improve a situation that was this bad? He still ended up doing a stent on him because he said he wasn't in danger. And he said, if I'd known it, uh, how about what more we could do, I would, uh, I would have not done that. And developed a practice that is now four days out of the week, pure nutrition, one day out of the week, still does procedures. There's always a few that don't want to change. And um, so Dr. Gundry uh, uh, was, was, a, was a, an influence on me uh, that long ago. Uh, and um, I, uh, I, I just, uh, and to this day in my practice, I wish I could show him some of the cases that we go through, but he's a busy guy and, and so am I, so we'll just let that be. But back to the Aborigines. Here's what they ate on average. They had them do questionnaires on what, what their diet was. And it struck me, it's almost identical to what us, us Americans eat. Here it is. Per year, 29 pounds of french fries, 23 pounds of pizza, 24 pounds of ice cream, 53 gallons of soda, 24 pounds of artificial sweeteners, and 2.7 pounds of sodium. On top of that, every day, 2,700 calories. This is what our bodies has to withstand. I am always shocked by how much we can actually process and live a relatively normal life in spite of that incredible abuse. This 
was done for an average of 30 to 40 years and yet almost all the signs and symptoms were reversed in only seven weeks. Isn't that incredible? That's got to give us hope of all the things that we can do. This stands for endothelial dysfunction. I know what some of you were thinking. Endothelial dysfunction is where all the research is at. Endothelial dysfunction is if this is the artery, it is surrounded by a muscle layer and around that there's a fibrous layer that kind of holds it all together like a tire around an inner tube. But the very inner layer is called endothelium. It's only one cell thick. And it is one active, alive, happening thing, just like the intestinal wall. It is prone to insult. It, gets, has, to withstand, it has to withstand incredible abuse. And over time can wear down, just like the gut lining can wear down, and starts becoming leaky. And when it gets leaky, you get a bunch of different reactions. One, you can have an autoimmune reaction. Let's say, let's just say your gut is on fire. You've been eating all these bad foods. Let's say you're sensitive to milk. You're eating the 24 pounds of ice cream every year. Your gut becomes a little bit leaky. Some undigested protein particles from the milk goes into your bloodstream. And your body has an inflammatory immune reaction against that. It attacks that. That is a huge inflammatory response that then can destroy parts of your endothelium. And it's like getting a scratch on the inside of your artery. Anybody goes, uh-oh, I better kick in my immune system to try to fix that. It, and this happens to all of us. When the immune system kicks in, it secretes chemotoxins, it secretes cytokines, white blood cells, and yes, we have cholesterol come to the rescue. Cholesterol is a good thing. We need it. LDLs particularly, the smaller particles go in there and bury themselves into the site to try to fix it and then stay there. If this insult continues, this area becomes larger, even smooth muscle cells invade into the area, more cytokines, more chemotoxins, which are just basically signalers, say, hey guys, we need help over here, more white blood cells rush in, and you get this toxic stew just bubbling inside the artery wall. Might not even show up. This stuff does not show up on angiograms. It's not until we have our total end stage that it starts bulging into the artery. But honestly, you could be bulging 80%, occluding an artery by 80% and zero symptoms. The old model, as I was taught in graduate school a quarter century ago, of heart, of, of, of coronary vessel blockage by atherosclerotic plaques causing issues is totally outdated. False, not true. What really happens is the coronary, this, this, this plaque, this, this festering uh, autoimmune uh, uh, condition, sometimes there's an event like, okay, I really want that Mars bar and then I want another one. Now all of a sudden, we really got all the defenses up because the insulin levels just went way up and that's called oxidation, oxidative stress, aging stress. Insulin causes oxidative stress and the body goes, I can't handle this anymore. That plaque can rupture due to increased inflammation because now it's like a hot boil and the contents get spilled right into the bloodstream. Now these contents is like a hot liquid and the body immediately goes to it and says, okay, this is a toxin and it clots the blood right then and there. These clotted blood particles swim downstream, whoosh, block something, you have a coronary event. It can be fatal right there. That's how heart attacks and heart disease works. This can be due to an immune system, autoimmune system disease, which is gut. We think that's 70% of them. It can be just an inflammation. So let's say you have a chronic infection in your sinuses and it's just festering there. It can do exactly the same thing. Chronic ear infections, chronic sinus infections, and most important of it all, periodontal disease and tooth infections that are undiscovered are one of the main causes 
of heart disease as well. H. pylori out of the gut, the ones that cause ulcer, same thing. They can swim into a piece of artery, create a separate infection there, so it's almost like a satellite infection if you want to call it that, and have exactly the same thing as an autoimmune reaction. Isn't that just fascinating? All of a sudden heart disease becomes a system disease, doesn't it? All these different systems are affecting it. Oxidation is a little bit different, but really in the end it's all the same. But oxidation is just stress from the environment. One of the causes is age. As we age, you get oxidative stress. The fine lines that you see through here, that's oxidative stress. There is some destruction of cells going on. Oxidative stress can also be BPA, the plastics. Yeah, I, uh, I, I noticed some, uh, some of the docs over there desperately trying to stay awake. There's a Starbucks right around the corner and they're come carrying in these big things of, of coffee. And then of course there's that plastic cover on it. And I was thinking to myself, Doc, do you know how much BPA you're actually swallowing here? Because all that hot liquid goes up into that plastic, it drips back down in there again. It's just a toxic stew. It's really bad for you. That can cause coronary artery disease right there. Oxidative stress. One of the main causes of oxidative stress, smoking. If you can get rid of smoking, it's amazing how many less cases of of coronary artery disease you'll, you'll have. So these are the main three causes of ED or endothelial dysfunction. Note also, and Dr. Stacy wanted me to, to say this one. She says maybe, I said Dr. Stacy, is there anything you want me to say to the crowd because she had, yeah, she had to go home early today. Excuse me. <clears throat> and she said, you know, with the three main causes of ED, why don't you mention that the body can absorb only a finite bunch of responses. In other words, we can all handle some insult. There's no question about it. And we can recover from that. But at some point, the jig is up. The body says, uh-uh, I can't handle it anymore. And that's where we start getting into trouble. And this is why I know of a case right here at DBC that we had virtually totally cleared of his severe angina. His heart issues were gone. I had made him gluten-free because with him he was an obvious reactor, his gut. We had gotten his sugar levels back in control. We'll talk about sugar levels back on, uh, soon again. And he'd had nine stenting episodes before he came to me. I says, I, I, I told him, there's, there's no, you don't have room for another. Well, apparently he did. Because he didn't show up for, and an, uh, we, we had got, gone well for years. And um, what happened is he didn't show up for a treatment. And... Uh, I got the call later from his wife that he had had a serious heart attack and was in for another stent procedure and they had trouble doing it because he had so much damage and he barely made it through. I'm thinking, oh man, what happened there? That's just, just unbelievable to me. We were doing so well. So I was questioning everything. I looked up his protocol and just, just go through all the steps. It seems like everything was on track. I just, well, it's one of those that I can't explain, you know, that sure keeps us docs humble. Then I asked, is there anything that was leading up to this? He says, well, he used to always have some beer on Wednesday nights. He had totally given that up, golf, and apparently gave in. He had just two beers, had his episode one hour later. He had a huge inflammatory reaction from the gluten. And on top of that, he had a huge insulin response because his body is not at all used to that kind of thing. It's basically like drinking pop. And that is what did it. There's no question about it. See, he had used up his responses, how many times that you can respond to it. That finite responses was used up. He had no room for error anymore. He was doing great, he really was. But there it was. By the way, he's still alive today. He's very much an excellent patient today and uh, eats exactly like he should. But I, mean, I keep reminding him, there, there's no room for any of that. So some of the main causes 
Again, we went through 400 main steps, but, but really the big ones. Metabolic syndrome really came up time and time and time again. This is what 27% of kids 10 years old today have. We are in an absolute health crisis with this. 27% of 10 year olds have metabolic syndrome. That is one step away from outright diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is a heightened insulin production because it's been repeatedly assaulted by too much sugar. And it, sugar has become so normal in our society that we don't see it anymore. Cutting back on sugar still puts us way out there what is normal. Cutting back is not good enough anymore. We need to go back and study what normal eating is. And normal eating is eating real food. If it has a box around it, it's probably junk. If it's packaged, it's not, probably not good. Be real suspicious of packaged foods. Eat real food and the sugar is an absolute killer because the heightened insulin response causes that inflammatory, that oxidative stress that I was talking about, which then damages the endothelial lining of the arteries, among other things. They also briefly mentioned that it doesn't just affect the heart lining, the, the, the lining of the coronary arteries, but especially the brain ones. And we feel that the, uh, uh, a big part of the Alzheimer epidemic that's occurring right now is actually metabolic syndrome. So I thought that was interesting. And I've seen that firsthand with our, our patients that we're dealing with, our brain patients, we call them, um, that uh, uh, are either gluten free, that they're either gluten sensitive, uh, heavy metal toxicity, or they have metabolic syndrome. And um, I had an interesting uh, meeting with one of my patients from Wisconsin. She, she flies in to see us four times a year. And um, she uh, got diagnosed two years ago uh, with having very rapidly progressive uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease um, and was basically told to put her house in order. That's, that's, those were the directions from the doctor. And she, uh, uh, she came over and um, uh, I right away took her off of gluten, just piled in the good oils, uh, nutrients for brain repair and uh, said absolutely zero sugar, just zero, snippet, nothing. Your body has run out of the responses it can do and you just cannot tolerate anymore. And she got right on with the program. She was in two weeks ago and she said, I have news for you. I said, what's this? And by the way, her speech is three times as fast. She's no longer stumbling over words. She's carrying herself confidently. She looks great. She's 72, about. Um, and she says, my neurologist um, had a confession to make to, make, make to me because I just had a visit with him. And I said, well, what's that? She says, we think we diagnosed you wrong. <laughs> so you just can't win and you know that happens a lot it, it happens a lot and uh, so I pulled the old records and there was some pretty extensive testing and there's no doubt about it that, that there is, we are, in fact we had the MRIs to show it, uh, as well um, but even the brain can recuperate for an, from an incredible insult we are insulting our organs from the outside in and uh, metabolic syndrome is a huge one. It is an absolute huge one. Hypertension. This is one, this one, uh, the cardiology associations just beat to death and it's true. Hypertension kills arteries. It's very damaging. It sets up an inflammatory response in the, um, in the endothelial. And again, that starts a plaque formation, which then leads to trouble. And by the way, it's not just about the heart. We know other body systems are affected too, even peripheral artery disease, right? Where the legs are affected, that's really the same thing as coronary artery disease. If you affect one piece of plumbing somewhere, you're going to affect it in other areas, but today's topic is the heart. So, so we're keeping it mostly to that. But hypertension, how do you define hypertension? Hypertension uh, is, is kind of, the research is kind of all over the place, but what I could glean out of this one is that you want to try to stay between 110 and 120 for your top one and 70 to 75 for the bottom one. That's about where you want to be. As soon as you go into the 130 over in mid 80s range, damage is occurring. Everyone agrees on that one. Does that mean you cannot handle high blood pressure? Yes, you should have high blood pressure at times. If you're in a time of stress, your body needs high blood pressure in order to pump fuel to the, the muscles or brain or wherever it's needed. But it's gotta be temporary, it's gotta come back down. And also what was really important uh, came out of this, your blood pressure should dip by 10 points upon sleeping. 
If it does not, you have arterial stiffness, calcification, which is an inflammatory thing, over your arteries and you're in trouble. So dipping at night is really important part of health. It was touched upon, but not real much, but autonomic nervous system. And this was done with AFib, where your heart goes all over the place, tachycardia, arrhythmia. So more of an electrical problem in the heart rather than the coronary artery disease. But it was mentioned that almost all of that is driven by adrenal stress, cortisol, affecting the autonomic nervous system. That's where a lot of the research lies. Now I'm going to insert some of my own experience in this one. This was not covered much uh, at, at the, uh, uh, actually it was, it was mentioned but it wasn't really, no research was presented on this one. But remember these were cardiologists presenting mostly the papers and, and not chiropractors and naturopathic doctors. But my findings are in my own office here that when you adjust somebody for arrhythmia or tachycardia, you can quiet it down just with an adjustment. We had one here last year, uh, right here in room three. Uh, she was uh, right at 170 and uh, a long time patient and refused to go to the emergency room. I said, go to the emergency room, go to the emergency room. I don't want you here. Uh, because at this, at this point, we're, we're talking a crisis situation. She's, in, she's almost 80 years old. And says, nope, nope, I don't want to go. I said, okay. So, well, I will try to adjust and really work on that part of the nervous system that controls your heart, which, by the way, is up through here and lower neck. So I gave it some soothing adjustments and did some stretching techniques. And wouldn't you know it, within about five minutes, it went down to about 100 beats per minute. It had been there for about 36 hours. It is amazing how the nervous system can control the heart also. It really wasn't covered much, again, because of the type of conference it was. Uh, but there is uh, some small studies that have shown that it, it definitely needs more research. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you just some, some things that I, I see myself. Heavy metals, however, was uh, uh, covered extensively. Heavy metals, uh, we think, is responsible for 40% of heart disease. You think statins address heavy metals? Heavy metals, mercury is rampant, and so is lead. And um, with just trace amounts of lead, and I'm glad to see the government revising downward the standards of lead allowed in our blood. Um, uh, with with uh, even the minuscule detect detectable amounts of lead, your chance of coronary artery, coronary artery disease is up by 38%. So obviously this is a major oxidative stress affecting the endothelial wall. Mercury and lead were what was presented. I'm sure other heavy metals have a similar effect. It's just I don't have the data on that. And genetics was really touched upon. Genetics is an important one. Um, but it was emphasized that it's only really responsible for 7%. It's just you have genetic tendencies. We all have stuff in our old family tree that sometimes you don't want to look at, right? As far as incidence of disease. And if cardiovascular disease is very prominent, that means you have a tendency to go there. But you don't look at that as a heart thing, so okay, what really is going on here? Do we have a tendency towards gluten sensitivity? Do we have a tendency towards emotional stuff, a lot of stress? Is there a gluten sensitivity possibly? It's, are we, do we grow up in a farming environment that has a lot of toxicity? So, and is our detoxification pathways not working? You can change your genetic expression, and you know that I've covered that, for those of you that, that have been here a few times, is that genes don't mean much. It's the single nucleotide polymorphisms that affects it. So if this is a gene and there's something sitting on top of it, that's what's important. This is what responds to the environment and tells the gene what to do. It can make the gene tell a story of horror, or it can make it tell a story of joy. Which would you prefer? You have control over that, whether you eat that ice cream or not. You can make it go this way, or you can make it go this way. And for some people, it's a very rapid response, depending on your genetics, and some people, it's a slow response. No, that's not always fair, but it is what it is. But you do have control, which is witness the Aborigines. They started giving different input to their genes, and that changed environment did an incredible good in just seven weeks time to the point that it fixed virtually everything related to coronary artery disease. 
So what kind of testing is really good? Because we all know that what we do is cholesterol. And I'll, I'll, I'll cover cholesterol in just a bit because I'm not throwing it out the window. But there's much more advanced testing than this. The one that everyone kept on repeating, and I have kind of a funny story to tell you on this one, is high sensitivity C-reactive protein. I, um, I had sent a patient to a cardiologist uh, for an uh, EKG because I, I didn't like what I was hearing on, on auscultation. Uh, the, the, rhythmia, the, the rhythm and some of the valves just weren't sounding like I liked, so I, I referred out and said, hey, we need an EKG and possibly uh, some further workup just to figure this one out. And uh, says, why don't we do some blood work at the same time, just do regular lipids and then break down the lipids, uh, which, what kind of particles, I'll cover that in a minute as well as some inflammatory markers. Homocysteine was one of them and HSCRP was the other one. And I think this is about eight or nine years ago. Um, and I, I get the call from uh, the cardiologist. First of all, he was wondering why I was telling him what to do. Uh, and, and, and secondly, uh, he was wondering uh, why C-reactive protein? He says that's just an, an inflammatory marker literally from the 1950s and that doesn't have to do, that doesn't have to do with anything. So I said, well, you know, there's a lot of research coming out of uh, my hometown, Rotterdam, uh, that shows this is a very important marker and maybe the most important marker. And th that research was really about three or four years old at the time already. So this is, this is old news, about a dozen years old. And um, it's, uh, it's something that just might be, uh, might be very useful. Um, I tried to say it tactfully and, and, and he, he ended up running the test and um, the CRP was very elevated on, on, on this patient. Um, but the, the, see, see uh, I, I got this call about four years later, same cardiologist, and uh, got on the, on the phone with him and says, well, I, I, I just want to apologize to you. He says, I was just at a conference in Rotterdam, that was coincidental, I thought. He says it was an international cardiology conference, and they mentioned that CRP is one of the most important markers that maybe inflammation is involved with heart disease. This fella, which I know on a casual basis, is considered the researcher for this entire, for a very large uh, uh, cardiology group here. Uh, and I'm thinking, boy, this is, this is I, one, I'm thrilled that, that he called. That, that, was, that was A1, uh, shows something about his personality. But, but number two is, this is stuff that probably, we were getting hints of about 20 years ago already. And even now, we're just turning the corner on this whole thing that maybe inflammation might be a problem because not that many cardiologists to this day use this at all. Homocysteine levels uh, it really uh, is uh, another inflammatory marker um, that, that has to be done with every blood work when it re uh, regarding cardiac testing. Lipid breakdown uh, is important too because um, LDL, the bad cholesterol by itself, is harmless. It is totally harmless and the levels tells you nothing. It tells you absolutely nothing. Now, we measure LDLs in this office. I, I want you to know that. If you have through the roof LDLs, it doesn't tell me anything whether your endothelium is being damaged or not. But it does tell me that we need to change your lifestyle. See, and that's how we utilize it. So when we do the, the whole cholesterol testing over here and we see that LDLs is high or triglycerides are high, which is indicating that you have way too much sugar, then we say, okay, we got to do something. Go see Tina, go into boot camp uh, and, and let's start straighten that out, retest your cholesterol and make sure that's turning around. And if those numbers are coming down, awesome. That means your lifestyle has changed sufficiently to start affecting your cholesterol in a positive way, which I'm hoping decreases inflammation, oxidative stress and autoimmune response within the endothelium. Does that make sense? So to truly know what's going on with that plaque formation, figure out where in those 38 steps you are of plaque formation, you've got to do the LDL breakdown into VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. VLDL1, VLDL-A, lipoprotein A. There's all kinds of subdivisions within them. And if you look at them under microscope, it's the teensy little golf balls versus this, the, the baseballs versus the soccer balls, versus the beach balls, those are all the LDLs and that's how they look. The teeny, teeny, teeny ones 
are the ones are, that are really evil and can penetrate through the endothelium, bury themselves in the artery wall and cause the inflammation must. The other ones don't. So let's say LDL is high, but it's, mo it's mostly the beach balls. They just bounce along harmlessly along the artery wall. Don't worry about it. They're doing their thing. They're, it's good stuff. LDLs make up estrogen, progesterone, your bile acids, which is your, your digestion. Uh, they're the fix-it molecules. They protect the nervous system in the brain. We need LDLs. You just don't want those little evil ones. So you can see that the breakdowns of the lipid is way more important than the overall cholesterol itself. Yet we are basing an entire industry on just LDLs, HDLs, and total cholesterol, which makes absolutely no sense. None. Zero. Zip. And that was established long ago. And that's why statins weren't even mentioned at this seminar. It was mentioned seven years ago, was a little bit up to debate, but really it's a non-entity at this point. Statins do not work. They do not work. In fact, I'm jumping ahead of myself now, statins have so many side effects that it has been published for the second time just about a month ago that three years of statin use increases diabetes incidence by 54%. 54%! Made headlines for a change, which I was glad of. But folks, this is old news. We knew this five years ago already. And still we're continuing down this path. Statins are major toxins for mitochondrial function. You know what mitochondria is? Mitochondria is the little energy cells within the cell. They look like little dots that produces energy for cell function. So your liver cells got some. The most mitochondria is found in the heart muscle. 38% of your heart weight is mitochondria. There's a lot of them there. They're out there pushing all the time because guess what? You thought you were overworked, check out your heart. It's going nonstop, no breaks. Yeah, it needs a lot of mitochondria. And here we are, if we give a patient a statin, we're given a mitochondrial poison, slowly causing death of cells that are fueled by the mitochondria. Major side effect of statins, congestive heart failure, weakening of the heart muscle. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? In Europe, before they got rid of their statins, they were adding coenzyme Q10 to it to try to counter that. Because if you give coenzyme Q10, that actually can help the mitochondria work better and slows down this process. Doesn't fix it or prevent it, but at least slows it down. They don't use statins anymore. There's a really interesting new way of measuring endothelial function, your heart function, by using an endopat machine. I'm going to be looking into getting one. Endopat is really cool. You put your arms on this unit. There's a blood pressure cuff right here. And you totally shut off your blood supply for five minutes. A bit painful. Yeah. And you got these little measurements of your blood flow. You got little meters right here. And it shows on, on your heartbeat shows on, on the screen. And then you release it and you're seeing the difference of this one versus this one. How fast does reperfusion, how fast does the blood flow go back to normal? It's an incredibly accurate test for coronary artery disease. We think it's the best one we've got. And it's so simple. So, it's called endopat. There's also a, a unit that measures it through temperature. How fast does the temperature come back? I, I don't know which one's better. I've got a lot of research to do on this one. Another one that's fairly new is ultrasound of the carotid artery. It's a, it's a very sensitive one and it just measures thickness of the carotid artery. If you've got thickening going on, we know there's a lot of endothelial disease, inflammation, autoimmune reaction, right? Oxidative stress going on and it gives you a very accurate assessment of what's going on inside the heart because what's going on in the carotids is also what's going on in the heart. Yeah, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. And something very interesting that I've talked about in the past here, my exercise classes, is heart rate variability. Heart rate variability, the, the, the variability not only from beat to beat, how regular is it, but also the ability to go from zero to 60 miles an hour, so to speak. Guy, guy talk there. Um, uh, but really, if you have, a, say, a regular heart rate of 70 beats per minute, are you able to get it to maximum, which might be 180? How wide is that range? 
you'll notice the very elderly whose heart function has declined, that their regular heart rate is 90, and they can maybe push it to 110. Heart rate vari variability is only 20. The larger the range, the healthier the heart. It's a pretty powerful measurement, actually. And yes, you can get that back, just like getting in shape for, say, running or walking or, or bicycling at first, it's hard. The more you do it, stretch that band, the longer it gets, and it's incredible how the, uh, that kind of exercise, which, which rele releases endorphins, which are hugely anti-inflammatory, brings back elasticity in the coronary arteries, brings, opens things up, cleans it out. You're using your body's own pharmacy uh, just, by, just as a fix-it-all. Talking about the pharmacy, that uh, one very interesting thing that I learned was melatonin can cure coronary artery disease. In fact, uh, they always compared it to statins, which was, okay, I don't want to hear about statins uh, at all, but that, that was the, uh, uh, even though statins weren't really mentioned as, as a therapy, it's, it's considered, okay, we, we compare it to statins, we compare it to stents, we compare it to bypass. Um, and uh, it's, it's melatonin just so, was so out there as far as effectiveness. And the theory goes that melatonin induces better sleep and you get better endorphin release at night because endorphins get released at night when you sleep. And that's very anti-inflammatory. Voila, it's the fix, fix it mechanism. We think that's happening. We don't know that for sure. So I kind of covered statins enough, I think. Um, uh, just one final word on, on, on statins is um, uh, it does not at all address the root causes of heart disease. You can have t perfectly fine high cholesterol if the body is not in an inflamed state, you're not under auto uh, oxidative stress, if you don't have the leaky gut, you don't have the autoimmune dysfunction, you're fine. You can have through the sky statins. I um, uh, had a new patient last year um, and she is uh, in her mid 80s. And um, as part of her workup, uh, we, we measured cholesterol and it was over 600. And her triglycerides were through the roof and everything was so elevated. And I asked her about it and she said, yeah, it's always been that way. I said, fine, I'm not gonna change it. Now she was under a lot of pressure by her doctor to go on statins to try to lower it. So there's no way, you're, you're in your mid 80s, you're, you're basically healthy, we're just gonna leave it alone. It's not harming you. So. Statins also is, is huge for causing memory loss, by the way. Uh, when you start dropping uh, these very beneficial fatty molecules, your nervous system suffers. So that's why it's also associated with neurological conditions. Uh, we did have a patient here once that came in with ALS, uh, which was uh, corroborated by um, uh, Mayo Clinic. And a ALS is very much an, uh, a fatal disease and was totally cured in three months just by taking off statins. Totally cured, yeah. And, um, I, and I had to fight for that one to, to convince him to, to get rid of these statins. I said, well, what does it matter? Just go off and, and see, see if, it's, if, if you feel better. So finally agreed and, and it, it basically saved his life. I knew we were in trouble with statins. About, um, I was, I, I could still, I, I had a rental car. I was driving from Tacoma Airport to a place called Gig Harbor where there's a big research facility where I was checking out a research facility where 40 scientists work. And I still hear, I remember it coming on NPR that um, uh, they had just lowered the normal of cholesterol from 220 to 200. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? So I went back and looked up at the, the, the companies that produce statin, and wouldn't you know it, at the last meeting, stockholders lead meeting before that, they had made a vow to the stockholders to increase sales of their statins by 30% that year. I, I, you know, these things just make me so cynical because really most of what medicine is today is one, bright, bright doctors caught in a very bad system and that bad system is really a socio-political machine. That's really what all it is. It's not about science anymore because the science is so strong in what, what I'm saying. It's so all over the place. Uh, it's in the main journal. Journal of American Medical Association has piles of these articles if you just want to Google it. So, how do you treat cardiovascular disease? And by the way, I, I'm going to conclude this talk by going after the number one cause of coronary artery disease because I have not yet mentioned that one. 
So I'm, I'm holding that one for last, but let, let's jump to some treatment protocols. Treatment. Get the patients moving. Yeah, we live in a very sedentary society and just movement can take care of so much ill. 10 minutes walking once per week reduces cardiovascular disease by 18%. 10 minutes walks, just 10 minutes. Give the heart the nutrients it needs. We are dealing with a society that is just so depleted in nutrients. We have so many deficiencies out there. And no, they're not the all-out deficiencies, although they are making a comeback too. Rickets, for example, acute vitamin D deficiency, is all of a sudden showing up everywhere again. Uh, that's just one example. And I had learned that out of the textbooks, never actually seen a case uh, until the last couple of years. We've seen a few cases. It's making a comeback. Um, but micro, I'm talking about micronutrient deficiencies, the little elements that are found in the plants that nobody's consuming anymore. And how do I know nobody's consuming it? Did you know that only 3% of our farmland is devoted to fruits and vegetables? 3%. It is, to me, that's just absolutely amazing. 80% of our farmland is devoted to corn and soy. Yeah. So, get back to phytonutrients. Magnesium deficiency is present in 80% of coronary artery disease. Magnesium. We prefer a form called magnesium glycinate because it's nine times as absorbable and is not constipating or induced diarrhea like some of the others. So magnesium glycinate is the gold standard. Magnesium helps regulate rhythm and helps normalize nitrous oxide release, which is a very important compound within arteries that helps open and close your arteries, regulates blood pressure. So somebody comes in with high blood pressure, I always give magnesium. Along with another one, I wasn't going to mention this, but it just jumped in my head, bonito peptides. This is uh, derived from uh, sharks, actually, shark oil. Uh, bonito peptides is considered a blood pressure medication patented as a drug in Japan as well as Europe and is incredibly effective. Its only problem is it takes four weeks to work, but it has no side effects. Anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories foods like turmeric, which is also known as curcumin. Proteolytic enzymes such as bromelain derived from pineapple. Your Flavonoids, which is found as part of certain fruits. Vitamin C came out as a big one. And I, I secretly thought, oh boy, Linus Pauling has got to be giggling in his grave uh, because, because Linus Pauling was saying this in the 1950s and won a Nobel Prize for it. Why do we have to rediscover these things? I don't know. He won two, two Nobel Prizes, by the way, and it's his work to this day is almost totally ignored. And what was really emphasized is low glycemic index foods. Just keeping those sugars down. Alcohol was touted as being extremely beneficial, actually, at one to two servings a day with a few breaks every week. That seems to be the key. Red wine being king. And over red wines, Pinot Noir. I almost stuck on my hand which year, but no, I didn't. Pinot Noir because it has the most Reservatrol in it. Reservatrol, research was all over the map. But what I could get out of Reservatrol, which is an active compound, and is touted as the uh, um, as the anti-aging medicine by some companies. In fact, the patent to Reservatrol was bought by one drug company for one billion dollars. So obviously they're seeing a huge future in that. Um, is, but the, the best, uh, the, the best uh, research that I saw was really five milligrams a day. Five milligrams a day. It's got to be high quality Reservatrol. This is really important. Uh, there's some capsules out there that contain 250. Mm, don't go there. More is not better. It's a little bit like saturated fats. We all know saturated fats and trans fats are really bad. French fries, right? Um, 
But did you know that coconut oil, which is saturated fat, is actually really good for you? However, we've got a problem with coconut oil. People are having too much of it. This is America, after all. A little bit is good, or is better. <laughs> One tablespoon a day of coconut butter or oil can clear out arteries. You go, you go to two and you start clogging. There's this fine balance. A little bit is good. Same thing with the Reservatrol. More is not better, folks. Quit smoking, quit drinking excessively, quit consuming the sugars. What is really an artery killer? Artificial sweeteners. It is toxic. It is absolutely toxic. High fructose corn syrup was mentioned as being 10 times more toxic for coronary arteries compared to regular sugar. They just lost a bid in court because they were calling it, they were going to call it some sort of natural sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. They lost, luckily. For once, sanity prevailed. Fish oil is the standard. And you know, this is a little bit maddening because this was discovered by a large trial. It was a large double, uh, double trial, and they, they went over it twice, in the late 1980s by our own American Heart Association. American Heart Association thought, we're going to put this thing to test because we had known for a long time that this is actually a concept that, that works because Eskimos, which have tons and tons of fats, especially fish oils, basically do not have any coronary artery disease. And what's going on with that? So th this was a thought that emerged out in the 1950s. So by 1980s, our own American Heart Association uh, started uh, doing the studies and found that two grams, which is basically two capsules a day, was incredibly effective. They sat on this research, did not publish it until early 2000, which to me is just a crime. We are being withheld information that could be really beneficial to us. Then they started working on a patent to try to make it into a drug, which they have succeeded. It's called Levo something, I, I forgot the name of it. And for essentially fish oil that's been changed slightly molecularly so you can put a patent on it, they're getting over 100 bucks a bottle for it. Mm -hmm. Covered by your insurance. Fish oil is tricky though. It's got to be clean because it's something you're on for life. So you gotta be fussy. It's gotta be tested independently for not just heavy metals, pesticides, rancidity, source of origin, it's got to be heat trial to make sure it's stable. And it has, to, uh, it has to pass that test every time. You don't want to be sticking something in your body that could be poisonous. So there is a bit of, a, there's a bit of variability out there. Another one that came up on top was GLA oil. That's borage oil. Uh, it's a, it's a evening primrose uh, oil. Those are all GLA oils. And um, gamma linoleic acid, that's the full name of it, uh, is extremely beneficial and maybe almost as beneficial as fish, as fish oil. I like switching it up once in a while. Once in a while I'll take GLA myself uh, because it has benefits that fish oil might not have. Coenzyme Q10 is absolutely huge. Coenzyme Q10 can reverse congestive heart failure. It can, I've seen patients walk in here that had ejection fraction, which is efficiency. You want 60%. I've had people in their low teens, they're not even theoretically supposed to walk, go into their 30s with Coenzyme Q10. Had a long time uh, patient uh, come in last year. He said, I can't keep up with my wife anymore in the sand dunes. He'd had bypass surgery about 20 years ago, so I know time was up on that one. Uh, and uh, had uh, just had absolutely no wind. It was an amazing thing to see because it was such a rapid collapse. And we put him on magnesium and coenzyme Q10. I used 800 milligrams a day. And this is stabilized lipid form, which makes it six times as absorbable. So it, it's an important uh, way, way to take it. It's, uh, it's, it's got to be that stable form. And uh, he was fully back, and I mean fully, within six weeks. So we see multiple examples of that. Coenzyme Q10 we also use for uh, uh, fibromyalgia uh, and chronic inflammatory diseases because it really fuels up your mitochondria. It gives you energy. A lot of athletes use it to build, up, build muscle. In fact, uh, Lance Armstrong, that was one of his secrets to Tour de France wins. He had seven of them, as you might know. Uh, an incredibly uh, gifted athlete that's now uh, wanting to become the best uh, uh, Ironman 
uh, uh, competitor in the, in the world, uh, and he's in his 40s, but he uses just huge doses of coenzyme Q10 to fuel his mitochondria. So that brings us to the number one risk factor. And I'm going to read this one. Oh, ha, good thing I made the nose. There's one more thing before I go there. And here it is. Gut fat equals heart fat. New finding. The fat that's in the heart, in the arteries and around the heart is identical to the fat that sits here. Absolutely identical. And this fat, folks, is from metabolic syndrome, high insulin levels. There's good fat and there's bad fat. The bad fat generally is a jiggly fat. Yeah? You know, you know the, 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 the farmer fat, you know those, those oh, there's the strong fat, that's hard fat, that's not jiggly. That generally is not nearly as harmful as the jiggly stuff. This, for more, most people, are, is, is a little bit more jiggly, isn't it? So that jiggly fat is very inflammatory. It responds to the environment. Let's say you had something toxic. That toxic <coughs> material, whether it's mercury or stress or whatever it is, a bad food, too much insulin, causes the fire to ignite immediately right in your body fat, right here, which then transports immediately to the, to the fat over here. So gut fat equals is, is heart fat. You can pretty much predict gut health or uh, excuse me, heart health by looking at somebody's gut. Interesting stuff, isn't it? Number one risk factor. I really applauded them for, for bringing this one out. Poverty. And I thought, poverty. But then the researcher started explaining it. Lack of attribution, love, and sense of focus or control. JAMA, new study out of Journal of American Medical Association. Lack of love, lack of attribution, in other words, not really taking responsibility and not feeling like you have a purpose and not having a tribe around you. Now what is your tribe? It could be an extended family, it could be your church, it could be just any social connect, uh, connection network that you might have. This is the biggest risk factor for heart disease. It goes beyond all the other ones that I said. It's that emotional factor. I thought, wow, they've really come full circle. Now they're really talking holistic, aren't they? They're looking at all aspects of health. There's an interesting little Italian village in Pennsylvania. And it is pure Italian. They eat horrible food as far as what they're supposed to eat because that we're, uh, they have Americanized their, their Italian diet. So we're talking greasy uh, pizzas and the, the, the whole thing. The, the Italian is not true Italian because you go to Italy, you know, it's, it's ah, fine food. Um, yet their coronary artery disease is just a tiny sliver of ours. Just a tiny sliver. They have three, sometimes four generations living in the same home. They're always eating together. We're not talking just families. We're talking communal gatherings every evening. And they studied these people that moved away. So same genetics. And as they moved away within one generation, they were right where we are. And the only difference is, because that one generation is still eating that Italian food. You know how Italians are. They're, they're doing their thing and they're going to keep that up for several generations. The only thing that changed was that social connectedness. Incredible the impact it can have. Large study. So poverty is not just financial because it also was with the financial. As income goes down, seems like junk food goes up. And there was a study on junk food on the cost because supposedly junk food is so much cheaper. It actually isn't. It's much more expensive on the fact that, of course, it causes, raises your, uh, your health expenses through the roof, so it's very expensive that way. But even if you combine a vegetarian diet with just a little bit of animal protein to junk food, you still come out to about the same price. So this was, this was uh, we're not talking organic food here. 
Um, uh, so this was published uh, about uh, six weeks ago and I even saw it in the mainstream uh, media, USA Today had it uh, and several other news outlets uh, carried the story. So yes, financial poverty causes stress but also our um, sense of uh, control, our sense of place, our sense of purpose, love um, and that under that I would have to include faith uh, which is definitely part of that whole uh, the whole thing so we are living in an impoverished nation aren't we uh, we truly are and we've lost a lot of these things and and um, uh, when I see that more than 40% uh, of our meals are done in the car I know we've lost something somewhere yeah 30% of meals are done standing up it doesn't leave us with much family time does it I guess eating together what some families make a priority is to do it twice a week uh, to me, that's absolutely baffling. That's not a way to be. This social connectedness is, is huge, and our hearts are suffering from it, and it shows. So, that was Cardiology 101. It's, it's a huge topic. Uh, I left out the biochemistry. I hope that's okay. Um, and I hit the uh, main factors. Hope you got something out of it. Yeah, questions.